is a uh, founder and a board member of, a, of an American uh, IT startup company, which I'm going to use as a case study to tell you everything you need to know about setting up, financing, marketing, and valuing properly running your software companies if that's what you're interested in doing. All right, so does everybody here know what we mean by a SaaS company? Everybody, yes? If you don't, don't raise your hand. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know, don't raise your hand. Okay, look. SaaS is, a, is an acronym for Software as a Service. Now, if you think about the economy we've been living in the last 20 years, just about everything we're doing is got some foundation in data, in data analytics, and the, the product, the service, is being provided you know, through, through laptops, through notebooks, through cell phones, okay? That's the medium by which we are selling and communicating our services, okay? So SaaS products cover everything from a big monster like uh, uh, an Uber platform, okay? Platform, all right? But the space that we call IT, I'm gonna use that term, the space we call IT is absolutely unlimited, okay? Human demand, human creativity are unlimited, okay? We live in what we can describe as a, uh, uh, an on-demand economy. I want to go from point A to point B, and I want to go there right now, okay? That, that was a demand that society has always had, and all Uber did was respond to that demand, right? Technology does not create markets. Technology responds to consumer demand, right? So consumer demand, of course, changes as, as the behavior of people changes, as our cultural psychology changes. Right? As that changes, think of it especially cultural psychology, as that changes, then the demands we place on the market to provide us with personalized services changes. Technology responds to that demand. Now the technology then in a feedback loop disrupts society. It, it eliminates some jobs, it modifies other jobs, it creates new jobs. It opens up space for innovation, new companies, new services, new products, and that feeds back onto further technological change. And it's a, it's a circle, it's a big positive feedback loop. And it gets stronger and faster every year, okay? Society is changing, our technology is changing, our technology is disrupting our society. Our society changes because of the disruption. That makes new demands for new products, new services, new ways of doing, for example, government, right? Technology, technology industry responds because they're in that innovation space. But the innovation space has to exist for a purpose. There has to be a consumer demand. There has to be a need. And all we're doing today is we're responding to all these consumer needs in much more sophisticated ways, okay? I mean, faster, better, cheaper, and for the innovators who see a demand and see a way to apply technology, we also make tons of money, okay? So, let, let's talk about our company. Um, we're gonna do this backwards. I'm gonna talk first about valuation, because that's a little boring. I'm gonna talk about financing. That's exciting for me, because it's more money, but it's probably kind of boring. And then we're gonna talk about marketing, because marketing's kind of fun. Spoiler alert. 
the number one, I work with lots of startup companies. This is pro bono, helping them. I mean, I have my own, but I, I work with a lot of them. Uh, I'll, I'll work with anybody, okay? And the number one mistake that I see startup companies making is they, they fall too much in love with their own technology. And they say, man, it's really cool. Look what it can do. Okay? Well, yeah, it's really cool, but then why, why, why do you have zero sales if it's so cool? Technology doesn't sell itself. You, you have to actually go out there and apply the, the same old ways of marketing that you would do 100 years ago to sell paper towels or potatoes. I mean, you literally have to have marketing to market your product. If your product, however, is software, you need a really special, different kind of potential client engagement and to, 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 to get them as a client. A different kind of engagement to keep them as a client. You have to find them using sophisticated technology because you're selling a sophisticated product, right? You're not selling potatoes. But, but we, we really tend to ignore um, marketing. Okay, everybody get ready. I'm going to push a button, and if it doesn't work, then that means I don't know anything about technology. Oh, thank oh. God. All right. All right. All right. We're gonna, this, is, this, this, is, this is the way. You guys are all business students, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you said yes. <laughs> no, this is the College of Agriculture. Um, all right. When somebody asks the question, what is the value of my company? If I'm a traditional company, right? I'm not like a manufacturing company, or an oil company, or, or a supermarket, okay? When the, you ask the question, what is the value of your company? The first thing we have to, to do is take out our income statement, and we have to calculate earnings before interest and taxes, right? Revenue minus cost gives you earnings before you pay your interest, before you pay your taxes. That's, that's EBITDA, okay? And it's just simply revenue minus operating cost. That, that EBITDA is a really powerful number, it's a really powerful number. It's the most powerful number on, on, the, on the income statement, not net income, no, no, no. EBITDA is the most powerful number. Because EBITDA tells you, tells an investor, what is the basic earning power of your company, or your project, or your investment, or your asset, okay? What's the basic earning power, regardless, regardless of how this company is owned, regardless of how it's being financed, regardless of how it's being taxed? Right? This is the basic earning power. Okay? That's why we call it earnings before interest taxes depreciation. Before you pay interest based on your financial structure, before you pay your taxes. This is the basic earning power. That is dictated by the market and by your own competence. It's your competence that dictates operating cost. You can be efficient or you can be inefficient. And it's the market that dictates the revenue because the market is dictating the price, right? You can control the quantity and you can control the cost, but you can't control the price. But that is really basic and it's really powerful. After that comes interest and taxes, okay? But that's what you focus on to determine what is the value of a business. Because I could take your business and, and I could make it better simply by being more efficient, okay? I can't affect the taxes, uh, you know, right? I can't affect the interest rate that's on the debt, but I can, I can affect that. All right, so that's, that's crucial. Now, so for all, because we're all business students, you take that EBIT DA, I'm not gonna go into the mechanics, don't have time. We take that EBIT DA and we, and we capitalize it, all right? And in, in one of two ways. I'll leave it to all the accounting the finance professors to go over. Well, we take that EBIT DA and we capitalize it to get a, 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 a value, okay? 
that works extremely well if you're working with a company that's very predictable, like a steel mill. And they produce X millions of tons of steel per year, every year, every year. The cash flow is very predictable. Okay? So that's, that works fine. This does not work for, huh? this does not work for SaaS companies. That SaaS companies are a non-traditional business model. They're the startup business model. Okay? They're non-traditional companies. They have a non-traditional business model. And therefore, you can't value them using these traditional valuation techniques. And here's why. In a software as a service company, there's only one number, just one, <coughs> only one, that matters. It's what we call annual recurring revenue, ARR. If I'm, I'm going to use my favorite example, which is a crossword puzzle app, right? Pick up your, your mobile phone, and, and there's these apps where you pay like $3 a month, and you can play crosswords on your mobile phone, OK? The, the only thing that matters to the value of that company is how many people continue to be clients and continue to pay on a recurring basis, $3 a month, every month, every month, every month, every year, forever. That's how you make money. You have to grab a client and lock them in forever. It's not like a supermarket. Somebody walks in, they buy things, they go out, they may never come in again. Okay, that's fine. But with SaaS companies, you've got to get clients, whether they're individual people, companies, government ministries, doesn't matter. And you have to you have to find a way to keep them forever so that they're just paying an annual fee to purchase your service. Right? All the time. Right? And so when, when you go to an investor and you say, hey, I got a, I, I got a really, cool, really cool cell phone app. Right. Uh, I'm a SaaS company. The very first thing the investor is going to ask you is, what's your ARR? And if you, say, if you say, I don't know, well, that'll be the end of that conversation. All right. but, but that's all he cares about. All right. he, he only cares about how many clients have you locked in forever, how much cash flow is locked in forever. Okay. So uh, the second number that we're going to talk about is what we call a revenue multiple. Because we're, we're still in a s situation where the vast majority of SaaS companies are in either the startup phase or the early operation phase. Our company is like four or five years old. Okay? And so you, you investors want to know what is the multiple of your revenue. If you're selling a dollar, how does that translate into value? Okay, and I'm going to give you an example so that'll make some sense. All right, this revenue multiple is really crucial, right? And it's it's some of it's under the control of the business owner and some isn't. All right, revenue multiple is all about the size of your cash flow timing, and the predictability. And in this case, cash flow means annual recurring revenue. So I go to an investor and I say, give me a few million bucks. He says, great, Paul, what's your annual recurring revenue? And I say, uh, as of Q4, $1.6 million. He says, great, tell me about your revenue multiplier. And when he asks me about my revenue multiplier, he's asking me, what is the size of your market? Okay, you're selling, you got annual recurring revenue of 1.6 million today. Is, the, is that 100% of the market for, for your software service? Or is the market 100 times bigger than that? Okay, um, what is the timing of this? Are you, are you collecting this, this 1.6 million? Are you collecting it every day? I mean, every week? Are people paying you every month? Or do they just pay you once a year? What's the... What's the timing of the cash flow? Because I don't want to look at your monthly income statement. I see income is up and down and up and down because you got some weird uh, uh, timing, cash flow timing system. 
And I want to know how predictable is it? I mean, are you really going to have 1.6 million next year and the year after that? And I'll say, oh, sure. And they'll say, well, prove it to me. And I'll say, okay, I'm going to prove it to you. Because I went to this really cool seminar in Kiev, and I learned how to prove that to you. Okay? So um, let's look at what's in the middle. Obviously, the growth rate of the economy you're in, but much, much, much more important, the growth rate of the space, the little, the little market space you're operating. Everything is a niche. Right? Everything's a niche nowadays. Okay? And software is the ultimate niche market. I mean, it is the absolute ultimate niche market. You've got to find your niche market, get your SaaS product in there, and then you have to understand what's the potential growth rate in this niche. What's the ultimate market size of my niche? Okay? And, right? Because again, right, I got 1.6 million in ARR. But if the total market's 1.6 million, then the idea of growth and market size is irrelevant. I've, I'm, I've already hit the limit of the market. If I've hit the limit of the market, my company's worth zero. Because investors invest in growth. They don't invest in somebody standing still. They invest in move, they invest in growth. So how big's the market? And how, how fast is it growing? And then, here's the real killer, right? Retention and churn. <laughs> Retention rate means, all right, Paul, how many clients do you have? And I'll say, oh, I don't know, 300. Great. Um, how many clients have you, have you lost? And if I say, oh, well, I lost 200 of them, two SaaS companies. They look at your annual recurring revenue, subject to all those constraints and qualifications I mentioned, right? right? They look, they don't just look at the number ARR, they look at all the qualifications to determine how good is it, how real is it, how, how, how much growth potential, right? Okay? And, 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 and they will then in their own brains are using some with pricing. My experience has told me that, that of those three, it's management that is almost always the problem, okay? Companies succeed because of the staff. Companies fail because of the managers. So any of you working for any company, go tell your boss that. He'll say, oh, well, who told you that? It's absolutely true. If a company succeeds, it's because the people who work there are doing a brilliant job. And if the company fails, it's because the managers, the owners, are idiots. They're doing a bad job. And so, but now they'll block that. But the big project comes, we make a bunch of money, the project's finished, and then we sit around for a few months and we don't make any money until we find another project. Okay? No one's going to invest in my consulting company. Even if they wanted to, I wouldn't let them because they'd be stupid. I don't want stupid investors. <laughs> you don't invest in consulting companies because th there, there's, there's no predictability to the cash flow. Okay? So, so the, the investor doesn't care that you're also doing some consulting and you know, you're doing whatever. They only care how much of your total revenue is coming from your, your software product. Now, we're going to move to the issue of, of, of marketing and finance as they go hand in hand. You, you go to an investor and you say, I got the coolest software product in the world. But he looks at you and he thinks that, yeah, I don't know, you're kind of stupid. No, no, 80,000. So at that stage, we thought people will take us seriously, right? Um, that was 100% of our revenue. So we didn't do any side consulting, nothing like that, okay? We had a growth rate based on the last year of 113%. We knew investors would like that. And we had a retention rate of, <laughs> I love numbers, like 99.2. <laughs> ah, ah, had, had to be an accountant that did that, right? <laughs> okay, let's just pretend that's 99%. Right? Let's, let's, let's pretend that's 99 Okay, now, my job was to be a strategic advisor, sit on the board and, 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 and help guide the company. 
Okay, I'm not doing the sales, customer service. I'm not the IT guy developing our really sophisticated platform, which now has some pretty, pretty cool uh, AI interactive stuff going on now. Okay, I, so I'm not that. I'm the strategic guy, right? <coughs> and I told the company, I said, look, we've got to prove two things to the world of investors. We have to prove not only that our product works in the little niche we have, right? Training sales and service people, most of whom are under the age of 35, okay? All right? But we have to be able to prove that our product, service, same thing, that our service it, it can apply to any industry that exists. And that means we have to not just have clients who are sports teams. Now we had we had some really famous sports teams. We had the San Francisco Giants, and we had the, we still do. In the New York Jets, and we have some of the Dallas Cowboys. I think we have all these these you know famous sports teams in America. But the problem is, is everybody says, "Oh, your 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 product is for the sports industry." Well, no, 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 because now the market's too small. We have to prove. So we ran out and we got. Uh, clients in the automotive sector, hospitality, hotels, right? Um, we have Hilton as a client. Um, that's, a, that's a good client. <laughs> um, uh, we have aviation, you know, airlines. Airlines have customer sales and service. Maybe no service. <laughs> uh, we have media companies, other technology companies, financial companies like banks. So we ran out and started to, to expand the space horizontally. Proving, proving that our product was applicable to different industries. Industries, I mean, we also have like retail, you know, uh, um, branded retail, okay? So there's a big, big, big difference between a sports team, uh, you know, between the San Francisco Giants baseball team and a Hyundai dealership in, in Johannesburg. I mean, they're, right? Those are, I mean, automotive and sports are kind of different. The second thing we had to do strategically, got to have a strategic plan, right? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Is we had to show that we were not limited by geography. We were unlimited. So again, we ran down to South Africa and signed up Hunda. We, 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 we have clients in the UAE, United Arab Emirates. Um, and by the way, they're using our product in Arabic because the platform can accommodate any language. Okay. Um, uh, uh, we, we, we have Wembley Stadium, we have UEFA, we have clients in France, Switzerland. So, so we did those two strategic goals. We met the two strategic goals. We expanded the proven range of companies, and we expanded the proven range of countries in the world. What does that mean? That means that our market is unlimited. Unlimited means... If it's unlimited market, it's unlimited in value, right? So there, there is no limit to how big we can get, how much money we can make, because, because we've proven it, right? You know, so that's really crucial. All right, the very first funding round, all right, I want sure you understand this. In the startup business model, you start off with what you call your Series A funding, okay? You get little different steps. And the reason that, that there's different steps is each step has a different strategic uh, importance, right? In our very first funding round, um, our brilliant, charismatic, you'll see him on the video, CEO, uh, Sam Coyote, went to an a, 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 a accelerator program in Silicon Valley called 500 Startups. And he did extremely well. They liked him. They liked him a lot. They liked his product. So they uh, 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 invested 125,000 for uh, 1% of the company or something. There's a question you have to ask. And because we're short on time, I'm going to give you the answer. Um, what's, what's the strategic importance of this round? This round proves whether you do or do not have any hope of having a business, right? I mean, if you can't get a small investment from somebody, some accelerator, some person, some venture capitalist, if 
if you can't get one small investment, then obviously you as an entrepreneur, your service has no value. Uh, uh, do something else. So that's the strategic importance. It proves to the world that we're real because somebody, somebody believed enough to put in that money. Then, huh? then the second round came along some time later, about a year later. And it took about a year because investors are standing back to see what are they going to do with that money? How's the company going to do? So in the second round, we found another, uh, 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 we found a venture capitalist in Newark, New Jersey, and they put in half a million dollars. What's the strategic importance of that round? Half a million dollars is a lot of money. That's a lot of money. I don't, I don't care who you are. That's a lot of money. Okay. What is the strategic importance of that round? Well, the companies that made the investment, they already, they, they already believe, because of the first round of investment, they believe, okay, these are competent guys and girls, they're competent people, and they have a good product. But the second round means that the investors, the market of investors, now believes that there is a a, a takeoff here. There is a future here. Okay? They say, yeah, you got a good product, yeah, you got a good company, but we actually believe you can grow, grow rapidly and become highly profitable. And to do that, you need money. It takes money to make money. It takes money to make money. So that was the proof that what we've what we had been doing technologically, administratively, in terms of our marketing, uh, in terms of what little growth we had, that, 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 that it proved we had a future. Right? Okay? The first round proved we had a product and we had people that you can take seriously. This is proof we have a market future. Um, all right. In uh, Q2, 2017, well, a year and a half. Q2 2017, we closed our Series A funding in the third round, okay? And we, we got 2.25 million from another investor uh, called NRD Capital. Okay, it came in in March, so it's like Q2. And this, this, this is the round that was the basis of the valuation. The first two investments, your, the company's too new, the investments are actually kind of too small. And so, so there, isn't, there isn't a way to put a really credible valuation. When somebody's going to come in and invest two and a quarter million, they're going to do a valuation. They want to know what is this company worth, because that's a lot of money. So the strategic importance of this round is that not only do, do, do investors say, the management's good, the technology's good, the product's good, um, there's potential. But we actually see rapid growth. Remember, we had 113% growth rate. So we see rapid growth. Wow, we see that you you have clients in South Africa and the UAE, not just in America. Wow, we see you have clients in banking and automotive, not just in sports. So so this is this is this is the proof that the market said they're at the takeoff phase. You know, an inflection point, right? So instead of growing like that, they're expecting growth like that. And we didn't disappoint them. Um, let's just drop to the to the bottom here. The um, the investor determined seven million. They said your company is worth seven million. I said no, it's worth nine. And we kind of discussed, and and we agreed. Okay, it's worth seven million. And that seven million was based on our ARR of four hundred and eighty thousand dollars at that time. And the investor put a multiple of about fifteen. On that now, most most software companies, it's like you know, ten. I mean, fifteen's the upper edge. Fifteen's the upper edge. They put that multiple on there. So so now we have a company that's got seven million, seven million plus the investors' money. So now we're a nine point two five million dollar company. Um, now jump to today. All right. This investor demanded rapid sales growth, high retention, 
because they put in two and a quarter million to 24% of the company. So now we have a board member that, that's, that's an important person. So um, right now we have 1.6 million in annual recurring revenue. But think about this, this is another mistake. Nothing grows, <laughs> nothing grows like that forever. I mean, even a rocket eventually comes down, right? So, so yeah, we, we had a multiple, an implied revenue multiplier of 15, but we can't sustain that. So if you look at something more within the normal established range of established SaaS companies that are trading like on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange or whatever, yeah, the range is more like a 10 to 12 multiple. And if we apply that multiple to that multiple range to our current uh, valuation, look, 16 to 20 million. That's what the company is worth. That's pretty cool. It's worth 9 million a year and a half ago. It's worth about, say, 20 million today. Right? Forget about the math. I hope, I hope you can see that the math is pretty simple because it's not the math that's important. Uh, now that we're an established company, our current investor and any potential future investors, they want to know what's the future value. Right? Pay attention to this because there's something called a pipeline. Right? We do market. We, we, we have potential clients. We have $4.2 million of potential clients and the the sales pipeline. Well, wouldn't it be nice if 100% of everything you did was successful? Well, it's not, right? So we go back in a really critical way, really wide, eyes open, no bullshit, serious way, and we say, what's the probability we're gonna get that customer, okay? And the numbers typically are 10% because it's like, yeah, they're not gonna, they're not gonna buy our product. Or it's 90% because in, in our gut we think, man, we're going to get those. I just know it. Or 50% meaning, eh, maybe yes, maybe no. All right, but you got to go through and put some knowledgeable but subjective numbers there. And if you do that, then our pipeline of 4.2 million is only 1.8 million. But if you add that to our current, then in the future we should be in this range. So if we do turn that 1.8 uh, million into, into new clients and we retain the clients, then in a year from now, uh, we should be, or two, we should be more up in the range of around 40 million, okay? What's important is not the arithmetic, what's important is the thought process, right? Because investors are really asking all those questions, I told you. Um, you know, what's, what's the size, what's the growth? Right? You know, are you keeping up technologically? What's your retention? Right? Okay. So uh, we're going to finish with this because this this is this is true. I'm telling you, nine out of ten startup companies I work with, whether it's SaaS or anything else, they just forget about marketing because marketing is so 20th century. <laughs> you know? I mean, I got the coolest software product on the earth. What the hell? It sells itself. People should be queuing up here. And I'm telling you, it, I, it, every time I see a company fail, when I get in and I, I analyze them, okay, I always come to pretty much the same conclusion. Well, they're poorly managed. And the number one area in which they're the most poorly managed is in marketing. As in, they don't do anything. Okay? <laughs> so, so here's what you got to do with marketing. Right? It's not a marketing. But you're going to see this in our, our quick little videos to finish. We, you have to create an image. We've created an image that, uh, well, that's okay. We'll come back. You got to create an image, right? You got to have an image. This is this is the, the modern world. You got to have an image. Okay. We're we're we we have an image which you'll see when you see the video. Um, you have to get noticed. Right? I mean, you've got to get your face out there and get noticed. And you have to be able, to, that, that's just in general. That's for like the whole world in general. You've got to create an image, you've got to get noticed. Um, 
But when you're dealing with a potential client, again, you have to be able, like in a couple of sentences, 30 seconds, you got to tell them, this is the problem my product is going to solve for you. You have this problem. You have, you have sales representatives who underperform. And we're going to increase their performance, which is going to increase your profitability. That's the problem we solve. Because you go to a company and say, hey, I got, I got cool software, but what's it do? You don't want to start telling them what it does. You want to say, it solves your problem of the underperforming sales reps. That's what it does. It's going to make your company so much more profitable because we're going to make your sales reps so much more successful. And then you have to be able to demonstrate that. And, and, and we do. We have all the data. All of our clients allow us to show other clients this is what our sales were before we started working with you guys. This is the results from the sales department after working with you guys. And, and we, we have that data. So we look, look what we did for Hilton Hotels. Look what we did for Hyundai. Okay. And so you have to be able to, to demonstrate. Uh, now, let's see if this is going to work. Um, is it, it's separate over here, yeah? This is not my computer, so I don't know how to make that go away. We have a tech guy, we have a D. Why it's worthwhile, well then you're finished. But that's the third one-man video you're going to see. And it's cool because we got Sam, the CEO, sitting there and a little clock over his shoulder ticking down 59, 58, 57, right, reminding people. The other thing, and we were able to do this because we're in America. Um, you have all these business shows on the TV in America. You have Fox News, you have Bloomberg News, you got CNBC. Um, you got all these business news programs, and they bring on uh, different kinds of business people, and they interview you, and it's seen by millions of people. And more importantly, you now own the video that you're in, uh, and so you can do like we did cut out a little piece of video and embed it in an email and send it to people. So we'll send out like, you know, 100,000 emails and we'll put it on our Facebook page. Hey, look, you know, the CEO gave an interview to Fox Business and he was interviewed by a guy, a, you'll see a bald headed guy on the right side, one of the most famous uh, startup investors in America. Okay. Does anybody here, anybody here heard of the show called Shark Tank? Oh, okay. Cool. All right. We got Shark Tank in now. Here. All right. All right. On Shark Tank is this bald guy named Mr. Wonderful. Mr. Wonderful wants to buy our company, but I don't like Mr. Wonderful. So, but he's a really enormously successful investor. So, uh, this is just how you, you, you create an image and you, 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 you get, get yourself noticed. And our CEO, he's going on every one of these these TV business programs, and he goes to conferences and gives speeches, and, and, and you know, because you just got to get out there and be seen. You got to be seen, you got to be noticed. Okay, and it also helps if you're like Sam, handsome and charismatic. Uh, that's why I don't do it. Well, that's like seriously why I don't do it. Okay. All right, so watch these three little videos. Um, we use these. One huddle. One huddle. One huddle. I have to say, I thought it was really going to suck, but it didn't. <laughs> it, it was really engaging, and I got into it. Training that shouldn't suck. That's why I think that should be your logo. I was going to take a royalty on that part. A company called One. It's upbeat. By the way, I mean, you know, it doesn't get the young part. But, you know, it's, it's upbeat. It's energetic. Okay? It's, it's high tech. It's cool. It's fun. Okay? And besides that, we're being paid attention to by some of the biggest in the tech investors in America. And we're on, you know, CNBC and Bloomberg and Fox News. And, okay, and we use that for for marketing. And yeah, we put it on our Facebook page, but we we, we send out uh, emails. We do a bunch of things. But don't 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 poo poo emails. Now we don't just send out emails blind. Okay, we. We, we very carefully cull contact lists so that we're going at companies 
who will uh, in the same kind of space, so we can go and say, well, you know, we're uh, working with Lowe's Hotel. What's wrong with you, Sheraton and Hilton? So we, we go find the training managers and we contact. And then we show up at uh, lots of conferences, give lots of speeches, give interviews. And then we get all this contact that we start following up. And here's, here's, here's so we'll finish with this. Because here's something how we, how we follow up. You, you send out an email and we embed a, a little video in it. One, something like that. We got a whole bunch of these videos. So we'll embed like a one minute video, like Sam saying, this is who we are in one minute, who we are, what we do. If they click on the video, we know about it. So we say, ah, great. You know, we have an analytic system. We say, great, they clicked on the video. So that means we can follow up. And we'll start following up, maybe with an email, maybe with a phone call. Maybe we'll try to start banging them on the, the training manager on Skype or Messenger. We'll, we'll follow up. But we, but, but we try to follow up in a way that fits our, fits our image. So for example, um, what you're going to see now is a personalized follow-up video. Because again, personal. Sales is personal, right? You're, you're not going to buy my service if you don't like me, if you don't trust me. Seriously, no matter what it is, right? So it's all personal. So this is concerning Wembley uh, Stadium, okay, where the in London, where they just held the Olympics, and they have, you know, Champions League football finals there, and all kinds of stuff, right? So it's a famous football, famous state. And we just signed them up as a client, their, their, their sales and their customer service. But in order to get to that point, we had to engage the client. So we, we contacted them, sent, one, sent some kind of a little video. They clicked, we saw, they looked at it. So we sent something back, and we saw they were studying that. So then we followed up to the training manager with a, a personalized video where what we did is we took the Wembley Stadium, you know, uh, book of facts, right? How big is it? How many seats? All that kind of stuff. And we, we, we made a little demonstration game just for them so that when we came back to contact them again, we can say, hey, we know you're interested. And look, we made a game just for you so you can see how this is going to work, all right? And uh, it's pretty cool. Let's see if this is going to work. Cool. Yeah. Hey there. It's very American. Mm -hmm. Very, very British, OK? For a client in the UAE, we wouldn't say, hey there, OK? But we're, this is Americans talking to Brits. What do you think? Just make it very good. Let's face it. Hey there. hey there, it's Donna from One Huddle. Our team sent over an email a few days ago, and I just want to make sure you didn't miss it. One Huddle, all your training in a game on your phone. We work with some pretty cool clients like ESPN, Lowe's Hotels, Audible, and a bunch of other. When the guy who ultimately signed the contract, when he opened that up on his laptop, he could, he could see very, very clearly. And this was the second one that was to him, and then that's the end. But he could see very clearly, you know, that it's his stadium, and, 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 and he recognizes the photos, and he recognizes the, the, the questions. So we're asking about the seating capacity and the pricing. You know, we made a simple demo. So, you know, in what year was it built? What's the total capacity? You know, what kind of sporting events are there? Okay. So kind of simple stuff, all right? But it was just a way to demonstrate, a very personal way for that client, this is what we can do to, to train your customer service right. Now we also sent along, you know, because this is a serious potential client, you know, studies that were done by uh, the Wharton School of Business that, 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 that proves the, the efficacy of our product. It shows, you know, uh, 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 using two different groups, one trained one way, one trained our way, how the people trained our way are retaining 90% 90, 90 and retaining it over 90 days and people trained by an old guy with a chalkboard are forgetting 90% immediately, okay? And, and, and all this data, verified data, 
open, transparent, that shows the increase in sales companies we're getting from using our training system to work with their staff. So, so you, you have different layers of depth and detail, but notice, and I'm going to finish with this, um, you have to first start by bringing attention to yourself. Right? So that's why you get out on the TV and you go to conferences and you, you present an image. And, and, and then when you start to engage a client, you have to keep going step by step deeper and deeper as they come closer and closer to you. Right? You don't just start by saying, watch all these videos and read all these studies by the Wharton Business School. So you, you, know, you keep getting them down. And because, again, this is an American style of business, you can see it's very friendly and funny. You know. All right, that's, that's it. Um, good luck for anyone who wants to go into the space, and then questions before we all run away. Great. We have the LA, we have the LA Ram. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Paul, for your presentation. And uh, uh, as you said, uh, yes, SaaS companies, they are looking for demands uh, on the market. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, as a strategic guy, can you tell us how to find the that demand? Like, uh, how to find the niche, the problem? Wow, that's a good question. Yeah. Big question. Um, well, no, seriously. I mean, I've, I've actually never been asked that question. You know, how do you find that demand? Um, my, my first guess is be, a, be a, a careful study of human behavior, right? I mean, we're in the personalized economy. We're in the on-demand economy. So you have to think, okay, what kind of personalized services and on-demand services do people want that that no one's responding to, okay? Um, uh, and then position yourself to that. Um, if you're thinking about companies, then you have to start looking at different companies and saying, what is their number one or number two strategic weaknesses, okay? And in our case, when, you, when we looked at all these companies that, that exist entirely on sales and service, right? I mean, a football team is not profitable unless people buy tickets and go there, okay? And so uh, uh, we identified that as a strategic weakness. And then we ran away and developed the technology that had come back and, and, and addressed that strategic weakness. But that's a really powerful question because it, it means that you have to look at society and you have to say, how, how, how are behaviors changing? How is consumer demand changing? And, and start finding little niches, whether it's a corporate niche or a consumer niche. You know? yeah. I mean, I guess that's what Uber did. Right? Thank you. Exactly uh, what they did. And uh, I'm also curious if you can uh, uh, recommend like any books related to the topic of your presentation. Um, yes, I will send a, a few good ones. Uh, they won't be directly related to here, but I'll send a few titles that have proven useful uh, for this kind of space and startups in general. Yeah. All right, thank you. Your time is appreciated. Sure. Sure. All right. Anything else? I... Tell me and then I'll repeat the question. The example? Yes, well, we're selling. Uh, um, the, 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 the question was about our company, and, and we're, we're all of our clients, I should make that actually very clear, all of our clients are corporations, and they tend to be big corporations with big sales departments that are generating, you know, tens of millions of dollars in sales. And, and, and so they're very, very interested in how to make each salesperson more productive. And they're also interested in how to keep each sales representative on the job. Okay? 
And so, so that's who we're, that's, that's who we sell to. Okay. Um, uh, but we don't deal with other small companies because our to make this worthwhile. You see, we, we we have a kind of we purposefully set high fees, okay, because we're aiming at you know big corporations like Hyundai and Hilton because they have thousands and thousands and thousands of people involved in sales and customer service. So so we don't need a lot of clients. We need, you know, a good number of big ones. Okay. I should have mentioned that because that's part of the business plan. I hope that answered your question. Anything else? Like, when do we get to go to lunch? You said about investments. Who do you would invest in these days? Who do I invest in? Yeah. Uh, I invest. In my own companies. <laughs> Anyone else? Like any other companies? Well, I'm, 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 I am open. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I am open to any really cool investment idea. But because I'm an entrepreneur, not a venture capitalist. Venture capitalists, they don't do anything. They just sit on big tons of money and they give it to people who do things. I'm one of these people who does things, <laughs> so so I'm more I'm more of, of a person who wants to receive investment than makes investments. But I obviously invest in all of my own activities. Uh, but if you have a good idea, let me know. <laughs> all right. Oh, one last question right there. Yeah, I don't need it. When you're a startup, right? Huh? When you're a startup, right? Like right now, you're let's say medium sized company, mm -hmm. and you already have clients. And when let's say you're meeting a new prospect, you can show them that okay, these are the people who work to it, and this is how people look. When you're a startup and you don't have something like that, you said you're an entrepreneur. How do you go for a Like you've not worked with anybody previously. How do you show people that? Right. Okay. The CEO and, and majority owner of the company, Sam Coyote, he came out of the sports training industry. Okay, he was managing sales departments, uh, you know, for for uh, sports teams, and he was managing these big, uh, uh, you know, gyms, you know, those uh, what do you call them, health centers or whatever they are. Okay, so so because that was his personal expertise. And that's where he had personal contacts and he had some personal credibility. So the first thing he did, because that's a really good question, he had nothing to show, but he, he presented himself to other uh, sports clubs and other sports, professional sports teams. And he said, look, I, I know what, what your sales and service people do for a living because I, I do that myself. That's my expertise and I have the experience. And, but I think I now have a better idea how to do sales and service better. And so he was, he was super, super micro-targeting his, his potential client base at the very beginning, okay? And, and you know, he had a product that's nowhere near as sophisticated as what we have now. But once he started to get some, some, some clients who were sports teams, right, you know, like the New York Jets or whatever, then he started using those clients as advertising for other clients, okay? So it starts to build. But your question is, how do you do the first step? And the first step has to be based on your personal credibility, right? Your expertise, your experience, your contact, so that when you go up to some guy and you say, this is who I am, this is what I do, and this is how I can make your company better, they believe you, you have credibility, right? And in Sam's case, it was only, it was only sales and service or the sports industry. And only later did we branch out to automobiles and hotels. So that's a that's a good one. Yeah. That's all. That's all. Shall we go? Yeah. Okay. I'm hungry. <laughs> no more questions. <laughs>